This morning is a special day. And although this is Father's Day, I have a word for the whole church. So, And uh, even the men who are not fathers yet. Amen? So uh, buckle up. Get comfortable. Actually, don't get comfortable. Actually, with me here, you will not get comfortable. How's that? Huh? So uh, we're going to just start the church or the service this morning with a word of prayer and then we'll have worship and uh, the word and then we'll close with a uh, communion and I, I, I want to somewhere in there really pray for the men because I feel like I have a word for the men and so uh, in our society men are getting pushed aside a little bit here for other agendas and let me just tell you what I think about this month pride comes before a fall you know what I'm saying. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that you've called the church to be a light in a dark place, according to Isaiah. And, Father, I lift up the church, this church and the church, Lord, your body of Christ that is here in America. And actually, Father, all around the world, past, present, and future, thank you, Father, that you are not the loser. Thank you that you are the winner. Thank you that you are victorious. Thank you that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And Father, you are a great heavenly Father. You are our Father. And today we worship you and we exalt you in the precious name of Jesus. Father, I pray for our nation. I lift our nation and its leaders to you, Lord. Father, I pray for strength and power and discernment upon the body of Christ as we live in this tumultuous time, Father, and so we commit this to you. We commit this to you, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Go ahead and put your hands together and give God some praise this morning. He's worthy to be lifted up in this place.
can do better than that. If you believe that Jesus is your best friend, if you believe that he loves you, you ought to open up your mouth right now and give God some praise that he deserves because he loves us that much. Worship you. Oh, you don't have to stop the worship because the music stopped. Come on, you can continue to worship. <laughs> worship is not even music. Worship is not even a, a tempo. <laughs> Father, we worship you this morning. Can we all just raise our hands and position ourselves for the Holy Spirit to just pour down his spirit? <laughs> Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. Father, we know that when Jesus was ascended to heaven, he is now seated at the right hand of God. So who's down here doing all the work? It's Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. We thank you for continuing to move in this place.
come on, if you feel the Holy Spirit in this place this morning. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Father, we worship you this morning. Everything that we do is because of who you are. Not because of who we are. Not because of what we've done. It's because of who you are. You are Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Nisi. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we get to do this. We get to do this because of who you are.
church, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my provider. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Nisi. Lord, you reign in victory because Lord, you reign you in victory. Jehovah Shalom, yes, you're my Prince of Peace. My Prince of Peace. And I worship you because of who you are. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Come on, church, raise your voice. give God a shout for a minute. Can we do that? Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Father. Ah, thank you, Lord. You know, the devil gets a little nervous when you get excited. That's why he's got two-thirds of the church not excited. Come on. <laughs> you know, did you ever notice, uh, uh, first of all, we don't do this here because it's church, right? You don't get excited outwardly. This is, this is a morgue, I mean, a church, right? But do you know that in Luke, when the, when the disciples came back, remember he sent them out two by two? They came back and they said, wow, we saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning, you know what Jesus did? Now, the Bible says that he rejoiced in spirit. You know, you can do this and rejoice in spirit. But that's not what the Greek said. It's a, it's a word that means to jump and twirl and come down. So Jesus jumped and twirled and came down. Show us what that looks like. Go ahead. No, 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 no. High and around. Go ahead. Yes! That's what Jesus did. Now, I'm 44 years older than Jesus was, so I'm not going to do that. But I can, but just not here, because I got steps here and people behind me. But let me tell you, the, you know, sometimes the Bible is pretty flatline about some of our emotions. It just says, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. And we read over that like, oh, cool. But no, what he did was he shouted and he twirled in the air. Because why? Because his disciples finally saw. 
You know how many times Jesus had to say, oh, you have little faith. How about this one? Get thee behind me, Satan. That's a weird one. What about this? On several occasions, Jesus said, how many times? How much longer do I need to be with you? You know, that's not a compliment. It seemed like that Jesus seemed to allude to the fact that maybe, you know, these guys, come on, man, learn. Do something. Get get with it. Stop being complacent and wonder where your next meal is coming from because you got me. Oh, come on. Amen. Amen. You know, the only people Jesus really rebuked loudly were the leaders of their denomination. (laughs) He never rebuked people who, uh, A, were far from him, B, were trying. He loved people. And when, when you get a revelation from God, Jesus rejoices. Too many times... We think we know. And we tell other people we know. Then all of a sudden we realize, wow, I guess I didn't know quite that much. Because the longer you walk with him, hear me, the longer you walk continuously with him. A lot of people walk a long time with him. They're not not fully engaged. But the longer you walk in an engaged manner with Jesus, the more you realize how much you don't know, how little strength you really have, and that if he doesn't show up, you're dead. See, when I was younger, when I was, you know, and Jane remembers me when I was 30 plus, you know, and I tell you what, it, when we left Tucson, the church there, it took three full-time people to take my place on staff. Because I was just, and I was such a know-it-all. I was the watchdog for the church, you know. You know, I was looking at who was off-key. And I'm not talking about singing either. And I remember John, what a wise guy. I mean, a good wise, what a wise guy. What a wise man. You know, I remember and I've shared this before, but I remember once seeing something with him. The church was huge, you know. It was Back in those days, 3,000 people was a monster church. We didn't have churches like today that of our size, of the size here. I said, John, do you, do you see that over there? And he said, I do. Now, I'm a man of action, right? If you see it, correct it. I said, well, are we going to do anything about it? He said, no. No. This could bring division in the church. And he said, Jack, whoever is with that person that's creating division, God will attract them and deal with them as a group. And if they don't want to be dealt with, he'll move them out of the church. Don't do anything, because I want God to do something. I thought, man. And then I began to reflect on the fact that I need more wisdom. I don't need more knowledge. I need more wisdom. So I'm going to talk about that today. Because the men of our society, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about many of God's people, men. But, but the men of our society are selfish, self-centered, seeking only that which perishes. They want to be rich. They want to have toys. They want to go up, they want to be known, they want to be recognized, they're unfaithful to their spouses, they're unfaithful to their friends, because they only want what they want. Now, that's not everybody, but that's kind of across the board in our country. And so as men of righteousness, as men of God, we have a job cut out for us, and that is to come out from among them. That is to be different. I don't want somebody to look at me and say, wow, I didn't know you were a Christian. Somebody that knows me. That's not a good thing. People need to know that I serve God, not because I preach at him, but because my lifestyle is beyond reproach. Come on, amen. And this message today is 
not just for the men. We have equal partners called women, wives, spouses. It's for everybody. I believe that God wants to raise up a generation of wise, understanding warriors. And men, let me tell you, men, let me tell you, sometimes the women are, are more warriors than we are. Now, I'm not talking about doing, going out there and marching and all that stuff. No, I'm talking about in prayer and on their knees and in insight. Not that we need to catch up, no. Because God has called us to be men. And look at the tearing down of manhood in our nation. They're either wimps or they're bullies. It seems like. But you have the calling of God on your life. You say, well, my dad was, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope. forget your dad. Your dad has nothing to do with your current situation. Your dad has nothing to do with who you are today. Period. You are who you are today because of choices you made in the past. I'm ready to preach. <laughs> I'm holding it together here, okay? So thank you. Thank you, OJ. Blessings, man. Love you. How many would like to see him anytime he's uh, free? Love you, brother. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. What a blessed morning it is to be in the house of the Lord today. So we welcome you in person and online. Um, again, thank you, Pastor OJ, for being here with us this morning. If you do not know, he's the assistant pastor for our Samoan church that worships behind us. So um, they had their Father's Day celebration here in the sanctuary yesterday. So they do not have service today. So he was blessed with the opportunity um, to worship together with us. And I'm thankful because I can take a little break. <laughs> so um, thank you, Pastor uh, well, first of all, of course, happy Father's Day. Let's give a hand clap for all of our fathers, not only here, but all around the world. We wish you a happy, happy Father's Day to all the fathers um, that are here today, to the ones that have gone before us and are now in heaven, our pastor, our leaders, um, and all the fathers and all of our families here today. Uh, we wish you a happy and a blessed Father's Day. But daily, we are thankful for our Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. He's a father to the fatherless, and uh, we're so thankful and privileged to know God um, today. So happy Father's Day, fathers. Uh, we do have a special gift for you today. So on your way out, um, we had a church member bake something um, special for you, so be sure to pick it up on your way out. Um, also, thank you for all those who have participated in our food drive yesterday. Thank you to everyone um, who have put your hand in to be a helping hand. Thank you. Lighthouse sends a big thank you to everyone. Um, so continue to spread the word for everyone to mark your calendars every third Saturday of the month here in our parking lot, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Lighthouse is here doing the food distribution for our community. Um, Donna, if I can ask, um, how many cars came through yesterday, if we have an estimate? That's okay. And that's okay. Uh, what I can say is, We've all we've had like four or five hundred cars come through here during the week. There's still hundreds of families that come through here. Uh, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday when they're here, there's like eighty to a hundred families that drive through here um, that get food and get help. So thank you to everyone who helps and continues to participate. Volunteers are always welcome. So thank you, thank you, Lighthouse. Um, this. Friday coming up, Friday, June 25th at 7 p.m. in our fellowship hall, we have our CLC movie night. Um, the doors open at 6.30, and this is a free event for all family and friends. So please feel free to bring in your blankets, your lawn chairs, whatever makes you comfortable. Uh, if you got the text message, thank you for voting and participating. We will be watching Raya and the Last Dragon. Um, so it was mostly geared for the children for our movies night. Um, but food and drinks will be provided as well. So please come in, enjoy, and sign up in the foyer so we can get a head count of everyone who's coming. 
Um, also, this Saturday, June 26th, there is an e-waste event um, happening here in the parking lot from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. They accept all TVs and electronics. They do not accept microwaves, fridges, batteries, bulbs, appliances, or furniture. This is strictly electronics and TV. So if there's anything that you don't use anymore, um, you know, in that pile of stuff at your house, all the mouses and keyboards <laughs> and, and old TVs and things like that that you don't use anymore, please stop by and just drop. All you have to do is come by on Saturday and drop it off in the parking lot. All proceeds will come here to Christian Life Center. Um, so, again, if you're interested, please stop by. Um, all kids have already been dismissed, but if there's any kids left, um, please feel free to go to Sunday school. They've started their Father's Day craft, um, so they did uh, try to collect the kids early. So, again, if there's any kids here, kids are dismissed. Um, other than that, have a blessed rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I have a couple of announcements myself. Oh, can't. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, you were, you were given a, a brochure on the foundation of discipleship. We are going to start a, uh, an institute class uh, July 14th. And um, I was trying to figure out exactly what to do. What, because when you go onto our, our blog, our website, on the top, you'll see different modules that uh, we teach. And we haven't had this in about a year and a half now, it seems like, because of COVID, et cetera. Um, but I felt like it was good to start it up again. And then we're going to not do it on Fridays, but instead we will uh, do it on Wednesday nights. Fridays is a good night, but it's, it's a time when a lot of us have different things going on and we can't always attend. But Wednesday night is, uh, you know, it seems like that's a little bit more doable. Is that good, is everybody? Okay, so if you need to, or if you'd like to be a part of this, and I, I really do encourage the men and leaders to be a part of this, because we're going to address um, some uh, key issues. And uh, we're, we're dividing this class now into three things, into three topics. The discipleship decision, the decision to become a wholehearted disciple for Christ. Wholehearted disciple. The second part is the believer's victory, and I believe that if if we don't uh, uh, fully grasp the battle that we are in, we, if we don't believe in it or whatever, we will walk right into the enemy's uh, uh, traps and, and he will use us without e us even really understanding what's happening around us. So that's important. And then three, uh, disciples as servants in his harvest. And I believe, I believe that even though we are very much a part in, in uh, going to other countries and in the international scene, um, I believe that missions begins here at, here at home. I've had people in the past. Now, remember, I've, this is not my first rodeo. We've been, Jane and I have been senior pastors for 20, almost 23 years now. And uh, I've seen a lot of people tell me they want to be missionaries. I said, well, how many are you reaching here at home? Well, God has called me to India. I said, well, missions begins here at home. And if you don't know how to reach people here at home, you're not going to be able to reach people outside of home. <clears throat> so I believe very strongly in the Acts 1-8 model. Uh, Jerusalem and Judea, which is Riverside and the Inland Empire. Samaria, which is a nation within a nation. And we have obviously, with that, we have uh, three Pueblo tribes that we're involved with. A uh, nation within a nation. Then the uttermost. In the uttermost, we are now uh, basically involved in, in China and in India two of the smaller countries in the world, and easier countries, too. Um, that's a joke. I'm not even sure how to grasp that. I don't know how to put my brain around that. I don't even know what to do sometimes. But here's, here's what we can do, and here's what we are doing. I uh, got a text from our brother in India. I won't say his name or anything or where. <clears throat> so I'll be a little vague so you follow me, okay? Um, but I got a, a text from him through... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, through Signal, and Signal is a pretty good app to, watch, to, to use if you want to be discreet about stuff. Um, it's encrypted on both ends, and in, et cetera. <clears throat> and what he said really troubled me. Not, not for him, troubled me because I hadn't quite grasped 
the importance of prayer for this. And we're talking about the Bible translation. We have 20 plus thousand dollars set aside for this translation. We can't seem to do it in India. The COVID has slowed everybody down. Uh, both of them in India and in China, both, both men uh, became extremely sick. Uh, complications not from only COVID, but just sick, uh, uh, et cetera. So, but then he began to say, Jack, I, 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 made a, I made a study of the people and the Bible translations that they were doing. And you know whose translation I'm talking about, right? You know, the people that we're involved with. And these, and I've, I've seen four different people who have tried to in, uh, uh, translate the Bible into that particular language. And he said, what we've noticed is none of those Bibles were ever published, and none of those people lived beyond, uh, 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 had, had uh, premature deaths. All of them had premature deaths. What do I need, a slap on the side of the head? <laughs> I said, I got your drift. We're going to pray. And I want you to pray. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, who I'm talking about, then talk to me afterwards. I want you to pray. Because remember now, this is still, this is a very sensitive issue. We're dealing with China and with India. Very sensitive. So we can't bring a, we, you know, uh, Bob Hunt of Four Square Missions Press has offered to, to, to print some of the Bibles, but there's really no way to bring them into India. You, know. you say, well, brother, brother Andrew did it. I'm not Brother Andrew. I'm Brother Jack. <laughs> so, and the Lord hasn't told me to do that. So there's no way to do this. Is it, are you okay? Yeah. You say, Jack, we're, we're kind of do, doing some dangerous things in the spirit. Really? I think walking downtown Riverside at night is dangerous. Man, I think driving down 91 is dangerous. So why would you not do that? And so yes, it is spiritually challenging. And yes, I know that there's warfare and that the enemy would like to take this whole thing out. Because if we get this Bible printed, there's just another Bible he has to contend with. And a whole lot more people who will read that Bible and we'll become disciples of Jesus Christ. That makes it all worthwhile. Am I willing to give my life for it? Not right now. <laughs> but yes, the answer is yes. Because I believe strongly in what I do. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm so proud of you for joining us in this. Can you imagine going into heaven, which you will, hopefully? <laughs> but let's say you're going into heaven, and all of a sudden, there's, here's this mob of people that come to you, and they say, thank you for bringing God's word to our people. Thank you for bringing God's word to my people. Can't think of anything greater. There's not a crown here. There's a crown there. We're not doing it for recognition here. We're doing it because of obedience to him, the king. You know, one of these days, you're going to hold a memorial service for me. Just like we might, we'll hold one for you. Hopefully I'm not here, but whatever. And you know, it's so much more important. I've done a lot of, I'm sorry, I've, I've done funerals in the past, bunches of them. And, and I've, I've been to funerals where the main thing that the person was known for was the, the food they cooked. I thought how pathetic that is. You know, I cook the best crepes in the world because my mom taught me from Holland. I make the best macaroni.
cheese. You ask Jacqueline, every bite cost a dollar. I make the best uh, olibala, Dutch thing. And I make the best pesto there is, brother. I'm an expert at pesto. But if you say that that's what, what I'm remembered for, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to raise from the dead, and I'm really going to kick you. I'm just not, I'm going to rebuke you sharply. Because <laughs> what I want to be known for is here's a guy who gave his life for Jesus. You know? Come on, amen. You know, my, my brother-in-law many years ago, he's actually, he's, he's, he's uh, deceased a long time ago. But he was telling me, he called me up, I was living in Tucson, he said, Jack, yes, hey, this is Eric, but man, I'm telling you, I've been concerned about you. I said, really? Why? What? I don't know, I've, I've paid attention to what you do. This was years ago, when I was, when I was 30-ish. And he says, and I, I believe you're going to burn yourself out for God. I thought, well, thank you. Thank you that someone notices. <laughs> No, 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 you're going to die. You're going to burn yourself out for God. I said, brother, if I wasn't living for God, I'd be burning myself out for drugs. I'd be burning myself out for art. I'd be burning myself out for photography. I'd be burning myself out for every insignificant piece of activity. But because you, you see that I'm burning myself out for God, I thank you for that compliment. <laughs> Hallelujah. I thank you for that compliment. Come on, really, seriously. Here's a man who burned out for Jesus. That's a good epitaph. Right? He was born in 1947, and he died, whatever, and that line in between, he, he went up in a flame of glory for Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man. You know, one time, uh, we're talking about years ago, when I was barely, I, I, I got born again in 1971. I, half, half this group hasn't even been born then, wasn't even born. And I was so dedicated to God. I went with a group from here, from Riverside. How many remember Dwayne Peterson and the Hollywood Free Paper? Anybody? Yeah, he, he, that was an incredible Jesus People newspaper. Look it up. But he, he put together about 150 people, uh, half and half, well, about two-thirds from here and, and another third from other places, including Tucson. And we, I, I went with him. I, hey, I was an ex-hippie, okay? I still had my hair, and uh, I had to have... My, my glasses off, my hair behind my ears, and all this stuff, you know, that, and I still have that passport, and I look so stupid. I look so ridiculously crazy. You know, I look like a, whatever. <clears throat> I don't remember how I went financially, because I had no money. I don't remember how I got my passport. You know why? Because I've never had a birth certificate. I was born in, in Kandahari, Indonesia, a little tiny village. I don't have a birth certificate. So I had to use my mother's birth certificate to get that. But I don't know. I, I found myself in Sweden. And in Stockholm, we landed. And I mean, we were on the front page of the newspapers. Big uh, pictures. and all. The, the, the Jesus people have arrived in Sweden was the headline. And we blitzed that country. I was one year old in God. We blitzed it. We didn't even care where we slept. All that was on our heart was the burden to share the word of God. And I remember this, I remember this one picture, you know, Rafa Carmody, if you remember, I mean, you don't remember, but he was, anyway, he was one of my friends. I mean, I, he and I seemed to be singled out to share our testimony many times. And I remember preaching at one year old in God, man, to a church that had two balconies, and it was packed. Incredible. Now, God had to, had to take a long needle and pop my self-awareness. But we, we, we preached in other places. I remember one time we were in a shopping mall of some sort. And here was a, there were two communist uh, soldiers uh, with a banner, hanging, uh, holding a banner, and I, I, felt, I felt drawn to talk to them. And, and our Swedish uh, friends said, no, no, do not talk to them. Do not. This, this would cause a lot of trouble. 
And so I walked away from him, and when he wasn't looking, I took somebody else, and we walked right up to them. A, a translator, we walked right up to, up to them, and I began to preach the gospel to this communist uh, soldier. And the banner that he was wearing started to shake like that because he was so mad. And the that was with me said, enough, let's go. And so I prayed for him very quickly, and we left. I don't know what happened to him. But if he was that mad, you know that he, God can get him, right? And so there's so much, there's so much. You say, Pastor Jack, you have so many stories. Well, stories don't come because I read books. Stories come because I have experiences. I do stuff. I listen to the Lord. I haven't done anything internationally for almost two years. It pains me. It just grieves my heart. It grieves my heart. We have two invitations to go to China and to go to India. Two important uh, invitations that I'm still praying about. And hopefully we can go either the end of this year, which is coming up pretty quickly here, and very possibly the beginning of next year. Now, you've all read the headlines. You've all heard the news. There's a more deadly virus coming. The finances are going to collapse. The big one will hit California. You know, et cetera, et cetera, right? You've heard it all. You've heard it all. The purpose of, of the news today is to scare you. If you're in charge of a country and you want to maintain your control, you scare them to death. You scare them. Fear keeps you captive to the dominant force of the devil. You can't be afraid. Fear will limit you and cause you to miss God's calling. Here's Jesus. Here's a leper. Son of David, son of David. The, the disciples are going, shut up. Jesus is going, shut up. And he goes to the man, the leper, and he touches him. Touch us. Of course, you, you, know, you, you know that you can't get leprosy from touching, right? Unless you have something on your fingers like a cut. Touches him. He touches. And he didn't even do this either. You know, like six feet, six feet. Extend your hand out. You know, touch. No, he didn't do that. He went up to him and he touched him. And he embraced him. And he was healed of leprosy. you imagine if Jesus would, well, I don't know, Herod has told us to be six feet apart. Yeah, but my arm's only two feet. Get a stick. How ridiculous. Did you know that your brain, a part of your brain, its function is social interaction? Did you know that? I don't remember what part of it, the front, the back, whatever lobe. It's, it's one of its functions it's social interaction. And when, the, when our government says we can't interact, they're basically destroying our mentality. Oh, I don't know why I'm doing this. Because it's not on my notes. I haven't even... I want to get to my notes. But we live in a cesspool of fear that is fearful of everything that comes our way. And somewhere, God needs to raise up a standard. Hallelujah. That standard is not just His Spirit. That standard are God's people who aren't bowing to the demonic pressure of fear and greed and all of that stuff. We are called to be different. Somebody said, well, Pastor Jack, you never prophesied. Just did. I don't have to say, oh, thus saith the Lord to Debbie. No, 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 no. 
I'm always prophesying, it seems like. I'm always saying stuff that I go home going, oh my gosh, did I really say that? <laughs> I don't really care, because I'm not mine, I'm his. And every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, uh, multiple times, my prayer is this, don't, actually my prayer is this, Lord, your words. Cease me from speaking your, my own words, Lord, your words. And, and his words are so much more intense than mine. So I have, a, I have a word for all of us. And I believe that this little prelude, <laughs> you know, segues into it pretty easily. But I want to pray first. Father, in Jesus' name, I give you thanks. Father, we are so thankful, first of all, that we are part of the kingdom of God. And that's a different kingdom than the kingdom of earth. Father, you know my heart. I'm not here to argue doctrine and all of that. Father, I'm here to energize your people to action. And so, Father, let your words spark in us. In Jesus' name. Amen? Um, we do have some prayer bookmarks in the back, in the little table in the foyer, if you want to take yours. Uh, that was a good series, and so I'm praying about another series. And uh, we'll see. I think that's it. Everybody say, Men of Issachar. Say it louder. Come on. Men of Issachar. It's a pretty weird name, isn't it? Issa car. Is that a car? Yes, it is. Men of Issachar, quite the history of that tribe. Let me read you something that's not in your notes. Your notes, I'm going to refer to them, but your notes are basically 10 wisdom principles. Uh, there's probably another 5,000, but you know, these are just 10. That's all I could fit on the page. Wisdom principles. But uh, let, me, let me read you just my intro here. There is nothing greater than to see men walk in godly wisdom as men all around us are self-seeking and justifying and grabbing and working for money, position, etc. I believe that men hold the key to lead the body of Christ into revival and into kingdom purposes. Would you agree with me on that? Men have the responsibility of leading the church into revival, and into the kingdom of God. And if we don't do it, God isn't going to blame anyone else but men. Had a, had a, uh, uh, we, we saw, we actually heard Dr. Yonggi Choi. Yonggi Cho, what's his, what's his, David Yonggi Cho? Yeah. He was the pastor of the largest Christian church in the history of Christianity. South Korea. This church grew, and I don't know where he is now. He was caught in embezzling and all that stuff, and so he's no longer on the, on the scene. And first of all, how do we get there? How do we get from pastoring the largest church in the history of Christianity to embezzling? What, what happened in between here? Who said that? No accountability of one of my points. If, you don't, if you're not accountable... If, if, if you're not open to people telling you that you're wrong or right or better or not, not good or whatever, you know what I mean, you, you, you won't last. You won't last. Anyway, forget him, the church. When we saw him, we've seen him twice. When we saw him, he said this, because the question was posed, why do you have so many women in leadership? And I'm not referring to anything that some of us have talked about. Nothing. I, this is what he said. He said, I, I pick leaders who are willing. And most of my men were not willing. Did you know that two-thirds of his leaders were women? World's largest church? Is that the norm? No, no, that's a, it's an abnormal situation. But, but the, the issue is not that women 
were. The issue is that men were not. That's my issue. His men were not. That was a male-dominant society. If you, if you go to Hopi or anything, that's a female, that's a women, uh, uh, it's a matriarchal society, it's very different. I said I couldn't use my men because they weren't doing anything. They were holding back. They were intimidated by their, by their wives or whatever. There was all these, all these things. And he said, I, will, I, I, use, I need to use who's willing. And those men were not willing. And I, I just broke my heart. I just thought, wow. If you, if you go, if, if you make a scan of churches, you probably notice that a lot of a lot of people who are really involved, especially in the spiritual part of the church, which it is, it, it, that's the major part, incidentally, are women. Right? And so my heart is for men. Oh, you've heard me talk about, you know, I believe that God loves the women. I mean, back in the garden, you know, Eve was deceived. And ever since then, God has tried to reinstall, in, in, so to speak, women with, with dignity and integrity. And many cultures around the world don't seem to get it. I'm talking about the Muslims and all that. You know, they don't seem to get it. Their women are basically no more than slave labor. Isn't it odd that Jesus, remember when I talked about resurrection? Isn't it odd that Jesus used a woman to tell Peter that he had been risen from the dead. <laughs> Why wasn't Peter there? You think that, you think that, what'd you say? John? Of course. They were hiding. And not this Mary. She's bold. She brought Peter. And they were all excited and they left, but she stayed. And because she stayed, she was the first person to talk to the resurrected Christ. Done. God done did it. Went all the way back to Genesis 3 and said, I have, you're part of the plan. John and Wendy are going to be ministering to Muslim people in Paris. Good luck. Better you than me. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's a, a thing you're going to have to really embrace, is that the men are, are, the men are king. You know, like, what's his name? Uh, uh, he's, he's the big guy. With, he's the guy that worked in the sewer. He's the bus driver, and the guy's friend worked in the sewer. Jackie Gleason. He's always trying to tell his wife, and I'm the king of my castle. And, you know, she's just not afraid at all. She gets right up into his face and then says, has some remark. You know, really, I love that show because he's so stupid. He is, su he is such, a, he's such an epitome of stupid manhood. Right? Self-exalted stupidity. So the men of Issachar, a tribe of Israel, were great, a, a great example here. <clears throat> and... Um, I'm going to read it to you, but if, if you're taking notes, Judges 5.15 says, listen to what it says. As the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, as Issachar, so was Barak sent into the valley under his command. So my first point in this part, anyway, is that the men of Issachar were quick to, judge, uh, to join Deborah as the judge of Israel. They were quick to enter into it. They didn't hang back. These men were men of uh, uh, action, so they were with the leaders. Point two, they were aligned, and this is my main point. If I don't get off of this point, it's good. This is my main point. And it, for men, I think it'd be really good to write this down. And I'd like for you men to write this down. In fact, I want you to take, this is how much I believe in this, an ink pen and mark it and write it in your, in your Bible, the cover. Now, you're, it's up to you to do that or not, but that's what I suggest. Because it's this important. The men of Issachar were aligned with the prophetic voice in the land and engaged in God's strategies of the time. 
They were apostolic warriors. Did you get that? Let me read it again. The men of Issachar were aligned with the prophetic voice in the land and engaged in God's strategies of the time. The men of Issachar knew the times and the seasons and knew what they were supposed to do. They were aligned with the prophetic voice in the land and they were engaged in God's strategies of the time. They were apostolic prayer warriors. These men were apostolic prayer warriors. Uh, apostolic, prophetic prayer warriors. Gosh, I, I, I want to see men of prophecy. Men who speak the word of God. Men who don't echo the, the, the phrases of our society, but men who echo the word of God. They say what God says in spite of their own feelings. Men of prophetic intensity. I speak my, my heart in prophetic statements all the time on Sunday mornings. And one of the things that I've probably hammered to death over the last year is the fact that we are not to be afraid. We are not to be, we're not to hide back. And, and the, main, the main story of, of this whole thing was Israel were not apostolic prophetic warriors. They were hiding from a, a single individual who usurped authority and said, I am the boss and this is how we're going to play the game. The entire army was hiding from one eight-foot giant. Dude, he's so big you can't miss. And who gave him the authority to make the rules for Israel? They didn't have to obey him. But they did. Why? Because fear will make you do stupid things. Fear will cause you to hide. You think that the enemy is after you. It also puts very little faith in the power of God to keep you. Um, how, how many listen to Dennis Prager? <laughs> if not, he's good. <laughs> I listen to him all the time. In fact, I have his app. Now I can binge listen. But it, one of his latest things was, the obsession with safety. <laughs> America has an obsession with safety. I mean, how many of you are old enough to remember playgrounds? You know what I'm talking about. Playgrounds. Gravel. We spun each other so fast we were flung out. We'd be flying for 10 feet and then slide for five and go home and go, Mom, I need some iodine, remember? That was a medicine from hell. <laughs> iodine. This isn't going to hurt, honey. Ah! <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to break the camera or whatever. <laughs> you know what I used to love to do? Swing as high as I can. I, I would swing until, until the, the chain wobbled, you know, was loose. And then, man, zing! <laughs> and I'd be shoot. You can't even do that anymore today. Now it's all rubber chips, three feet deep, lawyers standing on the edges. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He said an obsession with safety. Does that mean he's not for safety? Absolutely. You know, when you have a pool and you don't have a fence around the pool and uh, you have little ones, um, you're dumb. That's not wise. That's not an obsession with safety. That's being wise. But the, and I like what he said, the, the greeting, the, Instead of saying goodbye, what do we now say? 
Be saved. Be saved. Thank you. Let me interpret be saved. Don't do anything stupid. Wear your mask all the time, even when you're alone in a car driving somewhere. Be safe. Be safe. Don't come within 12 feet because six feet, that's been proven to be wrong. 12 feet. Don't hug, don't touch. Be safe. I think we need to be smart. So I'm going to start saying, if when they say be safe, I'm going to say be smart. <laughs> I am so tired of this, folks, as a person, not as a pastor, I'm just as Jack. I am so freaking tired, sorry, of, of this whole thing. Of this whole thing. You know, you know people, people have had spent like a, a year you know, behind closed doors and everything. And I don't know, Jane and I, I, I think I tried being behind closed doors for two days. And I was going to put some holes in the walls. I just like, ah, let me out of here. So I haven't been that, you know. I've worn my mask, but it's just, it's just so hard for me to do that. You know, because breathing the air, I'm sorry, COVID's not out in the air waiting to get you. You can breathe this air. Ah. Right? And oh, I still like to toy with people when we're waiting in line for some food takeout. I still get real close to them and they move away. It's like it's, they're still there, still doing that. Be safe. So all of this, I mean, all of this, all of this. Uh, you know, you, you have to know me to follow me where I'm going. If you don't know me, you're going you're gonna to think I'm saying all kinds of wrong things. Okay. So I hope you know me. I hope some of you on, online know me. I understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, it, because I can get very, very misinterpreted here. <clears throat> so the first one is Judges 5. Um, you know, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. The second one, 1 Chronicles 12, 32. The men of Issachar understood the times to know what Israel ought to do. And so uh, we read, and I, I've got to go real quickly here, but the issue is wisdom. How do you get wisdom? The Bible says in Proverbs, all throughout Proverbs, especially chapter 1, chapter 4, etc. Excuse me, get wisdom. How in the world do you get wisdom? Well, Solomon was a man with wisdom. So in 2 Kings 3, 6 through 14, I can't read the whole thing. And I'll just, I'll just tell you the story. He had become king, and he, he wasn't sure if he could really, really shepherd all of these people. So he went to God. He went to God, and he said, God, I need wisdom. And God said to him, this is verse 11 and 13, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked life for your enemy, the life for your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you nor, et cetera, et cetera. And verse 13, and I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be no one or anyone like you among all the kings of the earth. And so Solomon said, I need wisdom. And so his, his prayer to God was, God, I need wisdom. James says, you need wisdom? Ask God. Now, just a, a few verses later, he's sitting there, and this is how quick the, the prayer was answered. Because this just, it's not very much longer, or much later. Two women came to him. This is in uh, uh, 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28. Two women came to him. Their beef was <clears throat> that one of the babies had died and the other one was still living. And so they said, that's my baby. And the other one said, no, that's my baby. So what had happened was the lady whose baby had died, she switched babies. And they were just asked back and forth, back and forth. That's my baby. And Solomon said, bring me a sword. He held the baby up. He said, I'm going to divide this baby into two pieces so that you both have a piece. And as he was lifting the sword, one of the women said, no, stop. Give her the baby. 
put the sword down and gave her the baby. Not the one, the other one, but the person. She said, I'd rather have my baby alive and living with the wrong mother than dead. That's the real mom. That's wisdom. To have the courage to do that. Because one of neither one of them understood that. He would have to go through with that. Boy. See, wisdom takes guts, men. It takes guts. It takes, it takes standing up and not caring what others think of you. Not in a reactive mode. Not in a, you know, oh, not, not in this worldly manhood thing. But in the power of the Spirit. God is looking for and raising up today's men of Issachar of wisdom and action in these times of great division and confusion. How do I get wisdom? One, I ask God. If any of you lacks wisdom, James 1.5, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. You know, God is the true source of all wisdom. Proverbs 2, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Does anybody, do, you, do you know what, what wisdom means? You know, wisdom is, is, you know, knowledge is knowing a bunch of stuff. Understanding is knowing how that stuff may work. But wisdom is knowing how to use what you know correctly. That's wisdom. Gosh, there's a lot of believers who just use the word of God so wrongly and just out of their mouth they're slashing off ears and all kinds of stuff. You know, God's word was never meant to cut ears off, if you know what I mean. The qualities of godly wisdom, but the wisdom from above is first pure, morally and spiritually undefiled. This is amplified. Then peace-loving, courteous, considerate. Gentle, reasonable, and willing to listen. That's wisdom. Full of compassion and good fruits. It is unwavering without self-righteous hypocrisy and self-serving guile. Man, that's James 3.17 in the Amplified. It's, it's good to look, worthwhile to look that up. So point one, ask God. Point two, don't be afraid to be wrong or make a mistake. Men, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Whew, quiet. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Have you ever made a mistake? What'd you do with it? Bury it, pretending you didn't say it? Hopefully nobody caught it? You know, that's the way a lot of people deal with their mistakes. Blame. You made a mistake. Ah, oh, it's her fault. It's so easy to blame. I was in In and Out with Jeremiah. He, he's my witness. I'm, st I'm sitting in the car waiting. I am in park. Because when I have to wait, I don't, sometimes I'll doze off, you know. And I'm in park, brakes on. Car in front of me gets the order and backs into me. Ooh. She gets out. You hit me. So I said, no, no, I didn't hit you. Yes, you did. You hit me. And she's looking at her thing. And look, it's a good thing there's no mark on there. And Jeremiah's like, <laughs> you know, Papa, every time I'm with you, I have a story to tell. <laughs> so we, we waved at her. That, that didn't. Oh, anyway, OK. Number, don't be afraid to make a mistake, okay? We are all wrong. 
So what? Do you know who, you know who have made the most mistakes? People who have succeeded. Did you know that? You want to succeed? Make mistakes. You want to be safe? Don't do anything. Be accountable, number three. In our Exodus 33 in your notes, uh, can I see yours, Jane, for a minute? Men have to be accountable. Men must be. And I'm not talking about ac accountability over Starbucks or something like that. I mean accountability in the spirit. You, you need, as a man, you need to have one person that will hold you accountable for your thoughts, words, and deeds. As men, you must have somebody, not your wife, Another man to hold you responsible for your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. Way too many men have nobody in that position. So Exodus on the back here, Exodus 33, 12 to 13. Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. So number one, first ask God, James 1, 5. Number two, don't be afraid or wrong. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Number three, be accountable, Exodus 33. And number four, very last, then we're going to do communion, uh, be pliable. Be pliable. What does that mean? In, in Psalm 37, the last one in this, in this sheet, it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The word delight is the Hebrew word for pliability, for being pliable, for being bendable. You want God to give you your heart's desire? Then you be bendable. You be bendable. Don't be rigid. Don't be in charge all the time. Don't be right all the time. Be bendable. Be bendable. I try to be bendable. It's impossible sometimes. But I, I have to, when, when a little young person comes up and says, Pastor Jack, I, I, you, know, uh, you did this wrong. You know, and if I did, I have to be bendable. Or how bendable are you? What if God has someone call you at 12 o'clock at night for a loaf of bread? You know what I'm talking about here. How bendable are you? I am horribly rigid at that time. The later it gets, the stiffer I get. <laughs> right? Why couldn't you have called me four hours ago? Why well, didn't know I had that need four hours ago? Oh, it's so hard to be bendable. But if I do that, then God will give me the desires of my Heart, golly, that's amazing. You know, we think delight is to have fun, is to honor, is to sing, worship. Together. No, 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 no. This word, you can look it up. If you have a concordance, you can look this up. It means to be bendable. You know, the palm tree is a perfect tree for dry, windy areas, right? It can, it can withstand lack of moisture. It's very creation. From the trunk to the leaves, the, the palm fronds, is to bend in the wind without resistance. Bend in the wind. And a lot of times when the wind begins to happen of, of, of adversity or something, we just get this knee-jerk knee reaction. We start binding every force. We start proclaiming and all this stuff. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sometimes God needs us to bend for a minute. And Think and pray, God, what are, you, what are you saying? What are you doing? Hello? Lord, what are you saying to me? Are you good? <laughs> Those cupcakes have eyed me for the whole sermon here. How bendable. Men... How bendable are you? Wait, 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 I'm sorry. I need that one sentence. And I'd like for all the men to say this with me. Well, I want the men to say this with me. Can you do this? 
We are aligned with a prophetic voice. Go ahead. Louder than that, guys. Come on. We are aligned with a prophetic voice in the land. We are engaged in God's strategies of this time. We are apostolic prayer warriors. Okay, let's say it again. Is it up there? We are aligned with the prophetic voice in the land. And we are engaged in God's strategies for this time. We are apostolic prayer warriors. So we are aligned with the prophetic word of this time. The prophetic voice may sometimes be very confusing because we will have many prophetic voices. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to hear the prophetic voice from the Spirit. And you get that by kneeling, by on your knees, having ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The other prophetic voices in the land should affirm what God is already saying to you. And when you hear that, ask God for a strategy to be involved in pushing back the darkness and in, in bringing light to this horrible situation. Because our country is, in, is, our country is dying. Our country is dying. Our country is so full of pride in more ways than one. People are insane. They don't even know what sex they are anymore. Ask me, I can tell you. And when you get down to that base issue, you're basically saying to God, you're not my creator. It's an issue with God. And so as men, we must, we must be prayer warriors. We must be apostolic prayer warriors. Apostolic means that we go and plant something where there isn't something. An apostle goes and brings new God's word to new places. Puts his feet there. And begins to bring the, the presence of God to a dark and ugly place. I was told by four square leaders, I'll never forget this. I was gold, told by four, Jane was told by four square leaders that I was not to see the Dalai Lama because he's an evil man. That just empowered me to go see him even more. Because I wasn't afraid. And when I sat in his room, in his uh, waiting area, oh my gosh, I felt the peace of God. Oh. So let, let's do communion for a minute, and then I'm going to have the men stand. In fact, let, let's do that first. Men, would you stand for a minute? I want to pray for you. Sorry, I'm walking around too much here for the camera. <laughs> Let me pray for the men. You are an army of God. Everybody is, women, but this is Father's Day. And God has gifted you with a specific thing. One of the things that you have not been gifted with is a spirit of fear. That is not from God, that is from the devil. You have been gifted with an apostolic Empowerment, because you're a man. Where men don't feel like they have any value or whatever, they begin to control the situation. You're not controllers. You're not to be a controller. Because a controller can never fulfill the verse in Proverbs. You are men of Issachar who see the time and know what to do. Father, I pray for these men as well as men online that are watching. 
Father, we celebrate this as Father's Day, but Lord, we celebrate this as Apostolic Warrior Day. These are men. You always, throughout history, called men to fight. It's just ingrained in us. And so I take authority. I stand against. I, I, I push out that lie from the devil that has replaced the power and the integrity of the warrior man with apathetic backseat criticism, depression, confusion. God, I pray that each man in this place would, that that spirit would be replaced with a spirit of godliness, integrity, would be replaced, Lord, with, with that prophetic power and authority of a warrior. I pray, Father, that each man in this place would embrace the mantle of the men of Issachar to understand the times in which we're living and to know what to do. No longer are we going to submit to confusion. No longer are we going to submit to reactionary anger. Or, but Lord, we're going to submit to your word we ask that your word would take place, take root, become fruitful in our lives, Father, in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to, to, to father our children, to, to, to lead our families, Lord, to love our wives, Father, to, to be the men of God that you have called us to be, in Jesus' name. And I do away with all of these things. So, Father, as we receive, would you all stand for a moment? As we receive this communion, Lord, we take it, Father. Knowing the meaning of this. Lord, you said that uh, we were to do this often. That as we do this, Father, we would remember what you did for us. Lord, one of the things that we remember was that you never cowered from antagonism. Lord, you never gave in to evil. Lord, you always overcame evil with good. You always walked in the power of the Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that each one of us would be overwhelmed with the power of the Spirit. Lord, I pray for these families right here. Each family has its own unique challenges. Father God, I pray that you'd bring a unity between husbands and wives. Father, I pray that those who are divorced or separated, that you would give them great peace in you. I pray, Lord, for those who have been hurt by relationships, that you would bring a restorational process to bear. And Father, I pray for every person in this room, for every person online, that God is your true Heavenly Father, and He honors you and loves you. Father, we take this bread and we take this juice in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Hope you find a restaurant that's open or not crowded. Be blessed.
forgiven, we are healed. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you guys. We'll see you.